Okay, is everybody ready? Now that you're all best friends, and you're all taking phone numbers and email addresses, and for the younger ones, Facebook and names, you're obviously going to keep in contact when you go home, aren't you? Put your hand up if this is your first time at New Dawn. One person. Can give him a round of applause. One person at a time. Fantastic. Put your hand up if this is your first time on one of my talks. Oh, shame on you. <laughs> well, welcome. Put your hand up if you've been to one of my talks before. Oh, good. People have returned. <laughs> if you haven't returned, then sorry. Apologise in advance. Anyway, so what I'd like to do is, first of all, tell you what I'm talking about before we begin. Now, as you know, life, our spiritual life, is one long conversion. Conversion is not just once and then that's it. God is working on us every single day. Thank God. Thank God he doesn't give up on us. Thank God he constantly calls us to himself. Could you imagine if God gave up on us for one second? We wouldn't even exist. The fact that we exist shows that God does not give up on us. You know, if the devil had had his own way, we would not exist. He wants to destroy us because we're made in the image of God. So the very fact that God doesn't allow that to happen shows that God is merciful every single moment of every single day because God does not owe us anything. He does not owe us life. He does not owe us eternal life. He did not owe us sending his son to die for each one of us on a cross in the way that he did. He doesn't owe us anything. And he pours himself out and he gives freely, unconditionally, because he is perfect, pure love. And that's what he calls us to be for one another. Perfect, pure love. Anybody there yet? <laughs> Getting there. Well, that's the four st three stages of the interior life. The goal is to be the people that God wants us to be. Because God can create us and then leave us to it. He created us. And then in sending his son, he showed us how it is to be done. He could have just gave us the Bible and said, get on with it. But he didn't. Instead, Jesus came and he showed us who God is. He showed us what love looks like. Dying to self, being crucified, loving your enemies, praying for those who persecute you, blessing those who don't like you, who despise you. He's asking the name quite there, isn't he? But notice Jesus never asks what he's not prepared to give. Everything he asks of us, he gave himself. When he was being lifted up on the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. How many times do we say that when somebody's gossiping about us and we find out? Or somebody hurts us? How many of us have unforgiveness in our hearts? Family members that we don't talk to anymore? We should say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Because really, when we hurt one another, we hurt God. But we don't always know that, do we? We don't know what we're doing when we hurt one another. Not really. We don't know what we're doing to that person's heart that person's soul, that person's mind, and yet the very first commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbour as you love yourself. So we know what God expects of us. I hear all the time, people say to me, I don't know what God wants me to do with my life. Well, you kind of do. He wants you to love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbour as yourself. Do that, and then the God will take care of the rest. All we have to do is be faithful. All we have to do is focus on the present, because that's the gift that God has given us. But we, where we get into trouble is when we worry about tomorrow, or we regret what happened in the past. Somebody once said, don't be anxious about tomorrow, or be worried about the past, otherwise you'll be crucified between those two feeds. Good way of remembering it. Anyway. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us all here today to know you, to love you, to save you. And we are sorry for all the times that we offend you, all the times that we don't love one another in the way that you ask us to, and all the opportunities that you give to us as well to love one another that we don't see, maybe we ignore, or maybe we just don't want to get involved. We're sorry for that and we ask that you just pour your love and mercy upon each one of us. And we pray that you will speak to our hearts today in this talk, speak through me so that people will 
experience whatever it is you want them to experience and hear whatever it is you want them to hear. Pray that we will go away from here with a renewed strength, with healing, whatever wounds we have, with forgiveness for those who need it the most. And we pray that you would just transform us and give us the strength and the grace as well and the patience to be able to just continue to live our lives in the way you want us to live them. And we ask Mary, who is an incredible role model because she has already done all this as a human being. Uh, and we ask her to pray for each one of us and be our mother with us in these three stages of our conversion. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, before I start, what I'd like to do is a little test. Tell you a little bit about myself, just so you know who I am. I apologise to those who've already heard. It won't take that long, believe me. So, it, actually, it's good that I'm sharing my testimony anyway, because this talk is about conversion. And my conversion began when I was around 16 years old. I wasn't brought up Catholic. I was baptised Church of England when I was a baby. Didn't know anything about God growing up. Didn't know anything about the Catholic Church. Didn't know anything about the Church of England. And here I was, Church of England. My mum was a Catholic, not practising. My dad, Church of England, not practising. And my brother's the same. And so I didn't know, have any knowledge of God. I didn't have any reason to believe in him. Didn't have any reason not to believe in him. The love of my life was karate. I loved doing that all day, every day. I hated school. Typical teenager in Liverpool. Hated school. I enjoyed playing football after school, but I enjoyed playing, doing karate the most. And then around 16 years old, it was my instructor who invited me to go to church because there was a passion play on. And so I went, and it was strange, I didn't really understand it. And then later on, he invited me to the youth group. And when I went to the youth group, I met people who believed in God. And they were on fire. They were alive. And you knew God existed because God was so real to them. They made the Bible come alive, and they believed in it in their hearts. And that was the beginning of my conversion. Because when you are convicted with the truth, there is a response that has to be because we are created for truth. We're created by truth. God is absolute truth. And if we're created for God, then when someone speaks the truth, something happens, you can ignore it. But sometimes it's that strong, you can't ignore it. All of you, or many of you, I'm sure, have your own conversion story. Can you remember when that was? Can you remember how that happened? Can you remember, was somebody else involved? What did it feel like? Was it immediate or did it take time? Some people it's immediate, some people it takes time. But sometimes I think we need to look back at our first conversion. And sometimes we need to go back there and just remember what happened. What was the conviction in our hearts that God was, was alive enough to cause some kind of change in us? Because it's easy as Catholics to start going with the flow, mass every week prayer every day, you do the routine thing, and you just get into this routine. But Pope Francis says, when it comes to marriage, that it's important for the couple to always return to the first time that they met, to keep the romance alive. And we are married to God, we're the bride, he's the groom. And it's always good to remember the first time that we met, it's almost like a romance. So it's good to go back. And for me, I'm always going back because when I get talks, it's good to go back. And that helps me in my faith and I notice the difference. And so it was the conviction of the people that I was talking to that really began to convince me that God was real and that the Bible is real. And when you're hearing this for the first time, it is very strange. To hear someone say for the first time that there is a God, he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, he loves you, he sent his son to die for you on a cross, and the Bible is real, God speaks to you through it, and there is no error. It's a lot to take in. And so for me, it took a while. And so I'll go to the youth group quite a lot and ask a lot of questions. And it was a Church of England youth group. And then a year later, a friend of mine invited me to the local Baptist church. 
So I went to the Baptist church. And the speaker there also had that kind of a conviction. So I began to listen to him. And I began to grow then in love for the Bible and in love with God. About a year later, I went to the south of England and I was looking for work. And I went to many different churches, Methodist Church, Anglican Church, Good News Church, Revelation Church, churches that I've never even heard of before. I finally, in the end, I walked into a Catholic church and I met a priest. And the priest was extremely patient and kind. And he helped me with my faith. And I asked him a lot of questions. Why do Catholics believe in this, but the Bible says this? Why do you have statues? Why do we call you Father? You know, all the typical questions. And over six months, I got to know him, and he really helped me with understanding what the church, why the church teaches, what it does. And then I came back up to Liverpool, a changed person. So there's another conversion going on there. You can see how God is at work. In one way, he was at work in, in drawing me to himself. In fact, the very first conversion really happened when I went home after, he, after going to the youth group. And I remember going to bed, and I said to God, didn't really hear anything but I just said to God God if you're there you're real then you need to prove it to me because I don't know how to get to you I want to get to you but I don't know how to do it I can't get there by myself and then I left it there and I just thought to myself now let's see what happens that was 16 years ago now let's see what happens actually a little bit longer than that I became a Catholic 15 years ago but I thought then let's see what happens Never ask God to do something and, and think to yourself, let's see what happens, because you know what's going to happen. He's going to change your life. If you give him that opportunity, he will change it, and he will not stop changing it. He will keep changing it, and changing it, and changing it, as long as we give him the opportunity to change it. Sometimes we close ourselves off. Sometimes we, we're afraid, or we don't trust. And I love the divine mercy picture. Jesus, I trust in you, because that constantly reminds us to be open to whatever God wants us to do. And so I felt drawn towards the Catholic Church. And I'm back in Liverpool. Going to the back, I'm, I'm back in Liverpool. I'm still Church of England. So now I'm Church of England, going to the Baptist Church with Catholic beliefs. Yeah, and when I was there, I started asking a lot of questions to a lot of different people. And then I'd be on the phone back to the priest, backwards and forwards. And then eventually I became convinced that the Catholic Church is everything that I need, which is truth and nothing but the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. And I wouldn't settle for anything less. For me, it was either give God my all 100% or give God nothing. I didn't see any reason to just give half. It made no sense. If, he's, if he exists, then why not give him my whole life? If he doesn't exist, then he's, got, he's getting nothing. But I became convinced he exists, so I have to give him everything. Obviously, I fall, I'm weak, I need to go to confession far more than I'd like to. But it, for me, it's given 100% or nothing at all, and that's what it was back then. And so I started going to the church, and then I became a Catholic. And not too long after that, the same priest gave me a tape, and it was by Scott Arm, and it was on the fourth cup, and it was about the Eucharist. And I had trouble with the Eucharist around that time. I understood it, kind of, but I didn't really feel it. I didn't really experience what the church teaches in that it's the true presence. So that tape was a godsend. And I listened to the way he was talking and comparing the Old Testament with the New. And it was, it was, it was that, the Passover meal that really convinced me where Jesus is the Lamb of God. And it's not enough just to sacrifice the Lamb. And also in the Old Testament, had to eat the Lamb. And so in the New Testament, Jesus is the Lamb of God. And he spends a whole chapter, chapter 6 in John's Gospel, talking about his flesh as real food, his blood as real drink. And I remember somebody else saying as well, that whenever God says something, it never comes back to him void. It comes from Isaiah. I think it's chapter 55, verse 5. In Isaiah, he says, the word of God never returns to him void. It always goes out and it accomplishes what he sets it out to do. For example, in the book of Genesis, we hear God say, let there be light. Now, when he said, let there be light, he didn't say in darkness. The word went out, there was light. When God said, let the heavens and the earth separate and let the 
Earth produced vegetation, the heavens, the birds of the year. That's exactly what happened. And we see that in Jesus in the Gospels. When Jesus said to the blind man, receive your sight, it never, that word never returned to him void. He received his sight. When Jesus said to the paralyzed, take up your mat and walk, that's exactly what happened. When Jesus said your sins are forgiven, we know they are forgiven. So in the upper room, when Jesus holds up the Eucharist and says, this is my body, those words never return to him void. This is my blood. Those words never return to him void. In fact, St. Augustine, just 400 years later, the 4th century, said that Jesus held himself in his own hands when he gave himself to the apostles. And I think it was St. Ambrose who said that Jesus continually breaks himself for us in Mass. Every time the priest holds up the Eucharist, it breaks. And he constantly pours himself out every single day in the Mass when we receive it, his precious blood. So Christ is constantly breaking himself for us. He constantly pours himself out for each one of us so that we can receive him. And in receiving him, we become more like him. You see, that is the aim of conversion, is to become more like Christ. St. Paul says we are partakers of the divine nature. God wants us to become divine. And so conversion is every day. It's ongoing. It's non-stop. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes it seems impossible. And sometimes we're just on our knees begging God, where are you? Conversion is not easy, but it's certainly possible. And the greatest role models when it comes to all of this, for me, are the saints. Human beings just like us, weaknesses, sufferings, complaints, just like us. I think one of my favourites is St. Teresa of Avila, because she admits that she's a complainer, and she likes to complain, but she hates to complain. And she, you know, she's so feisty, I think if she was alive today, we'd be married. Because <laughs> she's just like me. It's, I feel like sometimes I'm reading my second self when I read about her. In fact, one of my favourites... One of my favourite sayings from St. Teresa of Avila is when she's in the carriage and it's raining and it's muddy and she steps out and she falls to the ground. She looks up to God and says, God, if, you, if this is how you treat your friends, no wonder you have so few of them. <laughs> she says it as it is. I want to talk a little bit about conversion. The word conversion actually literally means to change direction. It means to see and then see again. You look in and then you, you see again and then you draw. So you turn and you turn in the opposite direction. You do a 180 degree turn. Now before I ask you all, can you remember the first moment of your conversion? What that was like? The first time you encountered Jesus Christ because that's where the conversion begins. It begins with an encounter. You encounter the person. You encounter Jesus Christ. Now that cannot happen without the Holy Spirit. The Catechism teaches us that we cannot take the smallest step closer to God without God. Impossible. So it takes God's grace to bring us to Him. The fact that you're all here today, you're all like New Dawn, is God's will in your life. You can be sure of that. You can't get to God without God. It's impossible. So the first moment of your conversion, God drew you to Himself. And it began with an encounter, an encounter of Jesus Christ. And we see that as well in the Gospels. We see with the Samaritan woman at the well. She doesn't know who Jesus is. She's just going to get some water. But then Jesus tells her, if only you knew who you were talking to. You would have rivers of living water. Because Jesus is giving us the water of life. And she had that encounter with Jesus where she realised who he is. He is the Messiah. He is the promised one. He is the Son of God. He is the one that's come to transform each one of us. And she was transformed by that. So there's the encounter that led to the conversion, the transformation. And then what happened? She ran and told everybody who Jesus is. And that's what happens. There's the conversion. There's the encounter. There's the conversion. And then there's the evangelization. Now looking back at your life, where do you think you would be now if you did not have a conversion? 
If you did not know who God is, if you never met God, or if you didn't surround yourself with people who were praying for you, where would you be right now? Quite scary, isn't it? What's that? Dead. Many of us probably might say that. I've always said, if I didn't know God, I'd be on drugs somewhere in a good there. Because of some of the challenges I've had to face. Because of the loneliness as well. You know, when um, my brother, when he was 20, when I was 21, on the way to becoming a Catholic, not too long after, he committed, he tried to commit suicide because he was bullied at school. He ended up with clinical depression and it, it, was, it was bad, it was really bad. And so the, the, that changes the family. And every day, you always wonder, is he going to do it again? All of a sudden, the unthinkable becomes thinkable. And every day, you're just begging God to, to, to protect him and to look after him. And you can see how the, the family begins to, in a way, be closing on themselves because they're frustrated, they're angry, and they don't know how to handle it. It's new, it's for the first time. And mental illness is not something you can just put a plaster on or look at under the x-ray. It's something that's very mysterious and you really do have to, you, you are at the mercy of God when it, it comes to that kind of illness. And so every day you could, see, you could see the effects of that and especially the effect that had on me as well. And all of a sudden the attention of my mum and dad had to go towards my brother and so I was struggling in my own ways and the loneliness that came with that was absolutely awful. But thank God, God rescued me from myself before that happened because then I was able to cling to him otherwise I would have clinged to something else when you don't have God you cling to something else when the going gets tough you have to hold on to something else because you're sinking and whatever you hold on to you tend to want to drag down with you don't you like quicksand but you can't do that with God as much as you want to bring God down to your level it doesn't happen he brings you up to his but he comes to us and meets us where we're at that's what Jesus did by God coming down as Jesus, he then raises us. So God comes to us and raises us, and he's the answer. So many of you, in your own way, you could probably guess where you would be if you did not have God in your life, or if you did not have people in your life who prayed for you, who have drawn you towards God. Thank God for those people. But now you have to be those people for other people. Because other people depend upon you for your prayers. Think about how blessed we are that we can come to New Dawn. And yet there's so many people out there who need this who don't know about this. We need to pray for them. We need to invite them and encourage them. If you're scared of telling someone about Jesus, bring them here and we'll do it for you. Give them a tape. You know, give them one of the CDs. Make it as easy as possible. And not only is conversion turning around in the opposite direction, not only is conversion giving up everything so that you can say to God, here I am, do with me whatever you will, I completely trust in you. Not only is that conversion, but conversion is a process that lasts, lasts a lifetime because the end goal of conversion is to love God the way God deserves to be loved, which is unconditionally. And once we do that, then we begin to love one another the way God wants us to love one another, which is unconditionally. This means loving God without expecting or wanting anything in return. Anybody there yet? Anybody love God without wanting anything in return? No, me neither. It's a long way off. Anybody love one another without wanting anything in return? A long way off. But that's the goal of conversion. To love God the way God wants to be loved to love God the way God deserves to be loved. To love one another the way one another deserves to be loved. Now you might have people in your life and you think they do not deserve to be loved. They do not deserve to be forgiven. On Friday, I have a talk at quarter past two. I'm not sure where it is, I just know it's not in here. And the talk that I will give is on mercy, being the year of mercy. And in there I'm going to talk about forgiveness. I'm going to talk about how difficult it is to forgive. But there are plenty of people in this world who have forgiven. And forgiven in ways that you can't even imagine. Forgiven, forgiven people who have murdered their children. 
But that only comes about because of divine mercy, because those people were up to and open to God's mercy. And so conversion is a process, it's daily, it's every day. And it's allowing God to enter into the soul and transforming it. Now I gave this talk a few months ago and I was talking about the importance of allowing God to enter into the soul so he can transform us. And then the question was, how do you know we have a soul? If somebody says to you, if you say this to somebody and they say to you, how do you know we have a soul? How do you answer that? Good question, isn't it? Well, when you find out, let me know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And the answer I gave was because I just read about St. Catherine of Siena. Catherine of Siena used to have raptures where she would be, her soul would be taken out of her body and she would be completely possessed by God. St. Teresa of Avila was the same. So that's one of the ways you know we have a soul. Look to the saints and what happened to them. In fact, one time, St. Catherine of Siena, the rapture that she had, it was really intense. And every time she had it, her body just looked like a corpse because that's what happens when the soul leaves the body. You know there's something missing. If you've ever seen a body without a soul, a body that's passed away. When I looked at my mum after she passed away, you knew that the soul had gone to be with God because there was something missing, more than just blood pumping around her heart and brain. There was something missing. And so when Catherine had this experience where her soul was taken out of her body, the body always looked like a corpse. On this one occasion, everybody thought she was actually dead and she placed it inside a coffin. And they were all crying, they were all weeping. And news travelled all the way to the local parish. And the priest heard about it. So him and a brother ran towards the house and they seen St. Catherine in the coffin and they were convinced that she died. The soul had left the body. She was in a state of rapture, but they thought she was dead. And the priest began to cry really hard, really strong. So strong, he had a hemorrhage. He burst a blood vessel in his chest and it began to hemorrhage and bleed. The brother took hold of his hand, walked him towards the coffin, took hold of St. Catherine's hand, placed her hand on his chest, the bleeding stopped and life began to return and colour back to St. Catherine's body. Everybody rejoiced. She sobbed. She did not want to come back. She was so happy with God, she was so miserable to be back here. Everybody else was so happy. That just shows you, doesn't it? When, we, when we're sad for our loved ones that they've left us, oh, are they having a good time? Sometimes I think, are we more sad that we haven't gone with them? And so that's what he was for St. Catherine. So when somebody says, how do you know we have a soul? I say, look to the saints. And there's testimony there, the people who have, you know, St. Teresa of Avila, she warned people, I'm going to look like I'm dead because this rapture is going to last a few days, but don't bury me, whatever you do. <laughs> that's what happened. And exactly what she said, it looked like she was dead. You check the pulse, no pulse. She's clinically dead, nothing. But he remembered what she said, so he had to wait and wait and wait. And when they were ready to bury her, she came back. But that just shows you, again, reason to believe that we have a soul. Always look to the saints. So that's conversion. And we are called to grow. Our souls are called to become filled with more and more of God on a daily basis. And to do that, we have to love. We have to receive love. We have to draw closer to God in prayer and we receive God's life especially through the sacraments especially through the mass through what looks like bread and wine but we know is now is transformed into Jesus Christ his flesh and blood when we receive that then we're receiving an explosion of God's love within the soul you see the soul is wounded and continues to be wounded when we sin Every time we sin, we are wounding our soul because sin is cut us off from God and the soul depends upon God for its own life. So when we sin and we cut ourselves off from God, we are wounding our soul and hurting our soul and that needs healing. And sometimes the healing can be very painful and take a long time. And love covers a multitude of sins. That's what I was going for. Love covers a multitude of sins. So we have to 
receive as much of God as possible for our souls to be healed and then we are called to give him away. Saint Augustine, my favourite saint, he said the difference between God and truth and love and everything spiritual, the difference between the spiritual and the materialistic is if I give you something materialistic, for example, if I give you my car, I no longer have a car. And if you give somebody else that car, you no longer have the car, and on it goes. If I give you money that's in my bank, I don't have that money anymore. And if you pass that money on, you don't have it anymore. But the spiritual is different. If I give you God, I don't lose God. Instead, I possess God more fully. The more of God we give, the more of God we get. And so if you give someone else God, then you possess God more fully. And now I possess God more fully. And on it goes so that we all possess God more fully. It's like when we go to Mass and we receive communion. We receive the Eucharist. It's not like we all receive a little bit of God and together we make up the full. We are receiving the fullness of God. However much of God receives, it depends how open we are. It depends how wounded we are. It depends what state we're in, whether in a state of sin or a state of grace. But we all are called to give God away so that we can possess him more. It's the same with truth. If I give you the truth, I don't lose the truth. The truth becomes more complete within me. And I tell you what, I've learned that being a speaker. Because now it's getting to the point where if I want to become deeper in my faith, I think to myself, how deep can I go in my talks? So that when I give you as deep as possible, I know I'm going deep within myself. I'm allowing God to go deeper within me. I tell you what, this week, I thought, why am I going so deep? I mean, free talks, and they're all deep talks. I should have chosen something a lot simpler. And yesterday, I talked on um, the sickness of the soul. It's, it's what the church calls acedia. You can buy the tape. I recommend it. And today, mystical mysticism, is, and that's what we're talking about when we talk about the conversion and the stages of the soul during conversion. It's mystical. What is mystical? We talk about mystical all the time because we always celebrate something very mystical, the Mass. We call it the mystery of the Mass. It's not a mystery because it's a, like a crossword where you try and figure it out because it's so unknown and mysterious. It's a mystery because it's mystical. It's, and to be mystical, it means it takes us beyond ourselves and we're transported into heaven when we come to Mass. Something mystical is when you grow beyond yourselves and you go closer to God. It's supernatural. But in order to grow in our faith, it's not just a matter of receiving God and giving God away. We also have to ask ourselves, right now, no point doing it when we go home, we'll forget. Ask yourself right now this question. Do I really believe that God exists right now? Because it's, do I really believe that God exists right now? Because it's easy to go through all emotions and distract yourself from the doubts. But there comes a time when you have to face those doubts. Sometimes those doubts get too big, you can't ignore them. And that's what it was for me for a long time. It was like Mary and Martha. Mary was at the feet of Jesus, with Jesus. Martha was being busy and distracting herself from Jesus. And for a long time it was like that with me. I was doing, 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 doing. And it got to the point where I had to just stop and ask myself, do I believe in God right now? And that's when I experienced the doubts. And there's nothing wrong with doubting. In fact, it's, it's important to doubt sometimes because it helps us grow closer to God. We don't want to believe in God blindly. It's not blind faith that we have. We need to get to God with the gift that he's given us. And so the question is, do you believe in God right now? And if you don't, you know what the answer is. If you're struggling, you know what the answer is. The answer is always pray. St. Augustine had the same doubts. His prayer was, God, I want to believe. Help me in my unbelief. So we have to trust. But trusting in God 
believing in God is sometimes easier said than done. It's like the man who walked across the Tiger across the Niger, across the Niagara Falls. He's walking across Niagara Falls and everybody's cheering. Everybody's saying, Brilliant, you can do it. And he's shouting at everybody, Do you believe I can do it? And they're all shouting, Yes, we believe. And he goes all the way across, he comes all the way back. And then he says to everyone, Do you think I can do it without the stick? And they say, Yes, you can do it, we believe. So he goes all the way across, he comes all the way back. Then he says, I can do it blindfolded. Do you think I can do it blindfolded? And they say, yes, you can do it. We believe. It goes all the way across, comes all the way back. And then he says, what about if I have a wheelbarrow? I'm blindfolded and I have a wheelbarrow. Do you think I can do it? They say, yes, we believe you can do it. And then he says, what if I put a person in the wheelbarrow? Do you think I can do it? They say, yes, we believe you can do it. He says, any volunteers? <laughs> Silence. See, believing is one thing, but putting that belief into action is sometimes another it can be quite different, difficult. So, just to begin, on the three stages of the interior life, the first stage is called the purgative, and that might be familiar, purgatory. The second stage is called the illuminative, and the last stage is called the unitive. Any guesses who came up with these three stages? He's a saint, he would be, wouldn't he? He also wrote The Dark Night of the Soul. Ah, everybody's heard of St. John of the Cross. Well, this is where you'll find it, in The Dark Night of the Soul, the three stages of conversion. And The Dark Night of the Soul is, is, is separated into two parts. There's The Dark Night of the Senses, The Dark Night of the Senses, and then there's the dark night of the spirit. And entrance from one to the next involves these three stages of conversion. The purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive. And, it's, and he compares the very first stage to childhood. The purgative stage to childhood. He compares the second stage, the illuminative stage, to adolescence. You know how tricky adolescence can be. You know how much fun childhood can be. How tricky adolescence can be. And then he compares the third stage to the unitive stage. Now the first stage, the purgative stage, he says, happens to all of us when we are on our conversion, our first conversion. Happens to all of us. Many of us stay there. In fact, most of us stay there. Most of us don't enter into the illuminative stage in this life. In, in fact, hardly anyone in this life enters into the unitive stage, the final stage, which is where we love God the way God wants to be loved, unconditionally, perfectly, without any attachments in this world at all. He is our sole attachment, and we love one another the way He loves us. That's very difficult, and that's why for most of us it doesn't happen until the next life. Now these... How long you stay in each stage depends on the person, depends again on how open you are, depends how wounded you are, what state you're in as far as grace and sin is concerned. But most people, they enter into the purgative stage. Now this is the very first conversion, and I'm going to try and keep this as simple as possible because it can get complicated. And we're not here to be confused, are we? We're here because we want to grow and we want to be fed. So, maybe most of us need to know more about the purgative stage than the other stages. But the purgative stage is when, we, when we're on our very thing, when we're in a relationship with God, not just 15 years ago like it was for me, um, it can last a long time. We experience God at a very emotional level. We love God. And one of the reasons why we love God is because what he's given us emotionally. He's feeding us with feelings. He's feeding our ears with praise and worship. He's feeding our eyes with the beauty of creation, the sound of music. So it's all based on feeling and largely emotion. And what happens when we don't feel God? We get upset. We think, God doesn't love me anymore. I've done something wrong. We doubt God even exists. This is all part of the first stage of conversion, and it's important. 
to know about this so that we don't just give up. The last thing we want to do is give up just because we don't feel like God is near anymore. And it's important that we don't feel that God is near anymore. It's important that we don't have these feelings. It's good that we don't feel close to God. Can you believe that? It's true. It's not always good that we feel like we're close to God. It's not always good that we feel that God is close to us in prayer. It's better that we don't feel anything in prayer. It's better when we don't feel anything when we come to Mass. It goes against what we kind of want, doesn't it? Because I like being on fire for God. I like feeling great for God. But God wants me to be more than that. Because if I'm close to God because of the way I feel, then it's not because of God. I'm close to God because of the way I feel. And that's the problem. My love for God shouldn't be based on how I'm feeling. Because then it's dependent upon me. It's dependent upon my feelings. Just like a marriage. St. John of the Cross compares it to a marriage where two people who love each other. What happens when you get past that honeymoon stage where those feelings begin to disappear? Well, today, it's about to free marriages and in divorce. That's what happens. See, if you love each other, is feeling only. When those feelings go, people think, well, the love's gone. But you know that love is more than feeling and emotion. Because if it's just about feeling that you have with your partner, then what you're doing really is you're loving the feelings, you're, you're loving what those feelings can do for you. So in a way, you're using your partner to make you feel good. It's self-gratification. And you become more self-absorbed. It's only what you can do for me, how you make me feel. But true marriage is not about how you make me feel. It's about what can I do for you. It's about the good of the other. It's about loving the other as other. And it's about allowing the other, bringing out the best in the other person, regardless of how you feel. Because sometimes... Uh, you can come home from work. And the last thing in the world that a man wants to do when he comes home from working all day is listen. But guess what his wife wants to do? Talk. She wants to share. She wants to share the day. Now, he wants to come home, switch on the TV, get the remote and have a nice cold drink. But love demands more than that. It demands that he put down the phone and he listens and he's there for it no matter how he's feeling. God, the women are all smiling and men are not happy. <laughs> but that's what love is. More than feeling, it has to be more than feelings. And that's what it is with our relationship with God. So for all of you right now who are feeling so close to God, I really am sorry if I'm taking that away from you. I don't want to take it away from you. Because God, in the very first stages of our conversion, of our relationship with Him, He wants us to have these feelings. It's not that he doesn't want us to have He wants us to have them because he wants us to be on fire with him and he wants us to be a witness in the world. But he also wants us to grow up spiritually. He wants us to mature. And at this stage, when we're basing our faith on feelings, that's when he gives us what St. Paul calls milk of consolation because we're not ready for solid food just yet. In fact, this is what St. Paul says. Okay, but you know the chapter where he wants us to grow up and he wants to fill us with solids, but we're not old enough yet. We still need to be fed with milk. That's the initial stages of conversion. That's where we're being fed with the emotions and feelings. And there's nothing wrong with that. But like I say, he wants us to grow from that so that we become deeper in our relationship with him. And what St. John of the Cross says is that dryness of prayer is a good thing. Anybody here ha ever had dryness of prayer? Oh, look at the hands. Take a look around, because sometimes you go through it. You think you're the only one. It makes it a thousand times worse. Ever thought that dryness of prayer is a good thing? Some people do, some people don't. I hated it when it first happened to me. I never knew it was a good thing. It was only recently, after all these years of dryness of prayer, I'm finally realising that it's a good thing. I wish somebody told me this 16 years ago. I'd probably be a saint by now. Instead, when dryness of prayer comes my way, guess what I don't do? Pray. Instead, I wait till I feel like praying. Again, it's like a relationship. If I imagine a man and a woman, they're, they're, they're married, 
he doesn't feel like going home, does that mean he shouldn't go home? He feels like having an affair, or she feels like having an affair, does that mean he should? No, because you don't allow your feelings to lead you. But we do that in our faith. We do that with our relationship with God. We allow our feelings, a lot of the time, to lead us. Well, I don't feel like going to Mass. Anybody ever heard anybody say that before? Kids say it all the time when the parents try to drag them to Mass. Come to Mass, well, I don't feel like it. I don't care. You don't feel like going to school, but you're going. You're going to Mass. And it should be like that with prayer. We don't feel like saying adoration. That's the time to go to adoration. Because then you're proving to God that you're doing it to Him. And it's about Him. It's not about how I feel. Easier said than done. If I listen to my own advice, like I said, I'd be a saint. But it's like what somebody said. Do what I say, don't do what I do. And so if you don't feel like praying the rosary, that's the best time to, to pray it. If you don't feel like going to Mass, that's the best time to do it. Go beyond your feelings. And dryness of faith is not a bad thing. St. John the Cross said that we need to become dry just like a log of wood. Imagine a log of wood that's wet. It's heavy. So we need to become dry like a log of wood so that it becomes light. And all it takes is a, smart, a spark to set it on fire. On the news there's always fires going on in Australia or California. You know what starts it? A spark. You know why? Because the grass is so dry. We need to be dry. It goes against what we, what we think, what we do. The more dry we are for God, the lighter we are. Because the less of self that we're possessing, the less of the world that we're attached to. When we're attached to things, we become heavy. You know, Marino Restrepo, do you know who he is? Yes. Yeah, good friend of mine. He actually, in one of his talks, said that you never see a bird carrying a suitcase. Because it wouldn't take off. And God wants us to fly into him. So we have to become light. Being dry helps that. But maybe you're not there yet. Maybe you're at the stage where you're just feeling close to God. Go, go with it. But when you get dry, when you don't feel like praying, don't let that stop you. And don't let dryness discourage you. And when someone comes to you and says, I'm experiencing this spiritual dryness. I'm in a spiritual crisis because I don't feel like God exists anymore. You could say, brilliant. That's exactly what you're supposed to be. Because now you can really show how much God, how much you love God. Because now you're loving God and it's not because you're getting anything out of it. You're loving God for God's own sake. And if you're dry, brilliant. Because now it's going to take only a spark to set you on fire. But you just got to be patient and don't give up. Never give up on God. Just bear with God. Always say yes to God, no matter what it is God wants. And learn to hear his voice as well. Learn to listen to what his voice sounds like. Last year, not last year, uh, when I was in America a few years ago, I was listening to a speaker. Anyone heard of Jeff Cadence before? Yeah. Jeff Cadence, yes. He came over here. He's big in America. I was in Florida when he came to the local church. And he was talking about saying yes to God and learning to listen to God's voice. The topic of the day was step out of the boat. You know when Jesus asked Peter, step out of the boat. That's what we need to do. And what he was talking about there was that the boat is our comfort zone. We need to step out of our comfort zone. We need to take risks with God. We need to trust God. Even if it's not what God wants, we need to trust that he'll protect us because whatever we do, we do for him. And he was saying how there was, um, it was on the news. He actually made a resolution never to say no to God no matter what. And it was on the news in Ohio when he was driving his car. He had the radio on and he heard about a young girl. I think she was about 13 years old. And there was a tragic accident that had happened and the whole of Ohio heard about it. And it's a very sad story. And what had happened was this young girl called Tabitha, she was getting picked on by another young girl. And Tabitha went to her brother and said, I'm being picked on, what shall I do? And her brother said, well, the next time that happens, you need to scare her. So go into the kitchen and get mum's carving knife. Come out and pretend to, pretend to hit her with it. And that's exactly what she did. She went into the kitchen, got the knife, came back out, and she pretended to hit Tabitha with it, except, Tabitha, except the girl moved in the wrong direction. Tabitha ended up 
put the knife into her and it killed her. And now she's in court and she's being sentenced. And Jeff Hayden is listening to this on the radio and he had to pull over and she's being sentenced and he knows where the prison is, where she's being held. And he stopped the car and he prayed and he said, God, if you was here right now, what would you do? And he felt God speak to him because he knew how to listen. He knew how to hear God's voice. And that's something we need to do as well. Let's recognize God's voice when he speaks to us in the silence of our hearts. And whatever he says, don't say no. Take that risk. Step out of that boat. And so Jeff Cadens asked the question, if you were here right now, what would you do? And he felt God say, if I was there right now, I would go to her. I would tell her that I love her. I would wrap my arms around her. And I would say to her, I have not forgotten about you. And Jeff Cadens couldn't move any further. He knew that's what he needed to do. He could have easily have said, somebody else will do it. I'm not going to take a chance. We do that all the time. We feel like God is directing us to say something to someone. Or going to towards someone that we don't know. But we always think, well, God, somebody else will do it. Or we walk past a homeless person, somebody else will do it. But he couldn't move. And he didn't want to think somebody else would do it because he's decided and never say no to God. Step out of the boat. So he drove up to the prison. He walked in. And the man behind the desk didn't even look up. And Jeff introduced himself. Hello, my name's Jeff Cavins. I'm here to see Tabitha. And the man said, I'm sorry, but there's no visitors today. And then he stopped. He said, hang on a minute. Did you say your name's Jeff Cavins? He said, yes. He said, did you lead a woman's biblical conference a couple of weekends ago? He said, yes. He said, my wife went to that and she hasn't stopped talking about it ever since. Come on in. <laughs> You see how when we trust in God, he opens doors that we think are impossible. He opens doors that seem like they're locked shut. And so he walked in, and he was in the the room, waiting for Tabitha to come in. And she came in, she was shaking. In her hand was a piece of paper. And she came over, Jeff got up, he wrapped his arms around her, and he told her that Jesus wants you to know, I love you, and I haven't forgotten about you. And then she burst into tears, crying. And then he stepped away. And then he, and he gave her the piece of paper. She gave him the piece of paper. The piece of paper she picked up from the cell that she was in the night before. Somebody had left it there. It came out of a CD case, a Christian CD case. And it said, I love you. You are not alone. Sign, Jesus. All because he didn't say somebody else will do it. All because he took a chance. He learned to listen to God's voice. This is all part of the conversion process. Some of us are in our purgative state. The reason why it's called the purgative state is because God withdraws himself from the emotions and we suffer for it. Whenever God draws himself from us, we're going to suffer. But he doesn't draw himself from us from by grace, only by feeling, because he wants us to long for him. And he wants us to love him more than feeling. And so God draws himself, and that pain is a purification. It helps us realise where we would be if we didn't have a relationship with him. But it makes us go deeper now because I want to search for him. I want to meet people who are on fire. I want to get my prayer life back in order. I want to come on a retreat and I want to get that back. And that's why we come. Because we're yearning for God, so God removes himself. Just like a parent does with a child. The child is learning to walk, but that child's got to crawl first. And the, the parent's not moving the hands and the arms. The parent's right by the child saying, come on, inviting. And the closer the child gets, the parent withdraws. They're like swimming. You see it all the time in the swimming pool. A parent's teaching a child how to swim. The child's out there and you think the child's about to go under, but the parent's confident because she knows she's right there if there's any trouble. But the parent has to step away for the child to get stronger and learn to swim closer and closer. And that's what God does to us. He pulls away. So we should never say no to God. Always say yes. 
Last year, I was in this very room and I was given a talk, and I was given a talk on saying yes to God. Now, before I began the talk, I was in the main tent, you know where we eat, and I was in there and I was talking to a group of nuns, and they asked me, John, what are you talking about in your talk? And I said, it's all about saying yes to God, never say no, always yes, no matter what it is, yes, 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 yes. And the nun turned to me and said, are you going to be a priest? I said, no. <laughs> I freaked out, I was like, wow, God set me up there. And then I realised, it's easy to say yes, but when it comes down to it, sometimes it's a lot easier to say no. It's hard sometimes to say yes, and God knows how to challenge us. He knows how to get us right where he needs us, and finds our weakness, and targets that weakness. Sometimes I wish he targeted my strengths all the time, and only, the, and only my strengths, but he knows my weaknesses, and when he stretches me, how do I feel it? Thank God for confession. And that's the same with all of us. If he, he, if he didn't allow us to fall, we would never be able to stand back up and get strong. And that's why he allows us to fall. St. Augustine said, God allows us to be tempted so that we realise how weak we really are and how dependent we really are on him. That's why we need to be tempted. And so that's the purgative stage. God withdraws himself from the emotions so that we long after him. And you know when you're in this stage when you experience that dryness of faith, that dryness of prayer. And you know when you're being purified when you feel far from God, like God has left you. And there's a kind of emptiness, there's a darkness. And you wonder why. And you have difficulty focusing on anything to do with God. Five minutes in adoration feels like a lifetime. Going to Mass, forget about walking in the door. It's hard enough getting in the car sometimes to go to Mass because you're just distracted by a million things and there's always something else to do. And going to Mass all of a sudden feels like a purgation, a purification. Being silent with God, you always say, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll pray more tomorrow. I'll say the rosary tomorrow instead of just, okay, I've got that much to do. I need to actually pray to God now. Instead of, I've got that much to do, I'll pray tomorrow. I've got that much to do, I'll actually focus on God now. So God withdraws himself from us. And if you persevere, if you allow this purification to happen, and it could take years, I'm convinced I'm still in the period of stage, and it's been 16 years. And what happens then is you begin to enter into the illuminative stage. And the illuminative stage is no longer the dark night of the senses because you've been purified from the senses it becomes the dark night of the spirit and that's also painful as well it's another purification because god in this conversion process that we have god is constantly removing himself from us and coming closer to us in the beginning it's feelings and emotions but then when we get used to that and we get more experienced than that and we expect it and we know it's okay you know, I'm, no, um, I'm not going to leave God. Then he withdraws himself from the spirit. And the reason why then is because it's going deeper. He's going deeper into the soul. And what happens when he comes back? It's called the darkness because it, it's that longing for God. And it feels like we're in a darkness. We need the light back in. But what happens then with the spirit? After God re removed himself from the spirit and we long for him, and we stay faithful to him, and we stay as close as we can to him, what happens then when he returns, his light is so powerful, it shines on all the wounds within our souls, and we become overwhelmed with our own sins. We become overwhelmed with our own wounds, and then we experience a deeper darkness. We can't see the light because we're so immersed in our own wounds, and all the wounds that our sins have caused us. And that's where God is purifying us again, again and again and again. And that can take a long time as well. And that's called the illuminative. It's illuminative because God shining his a light, his illumination on our wounds, on the state of our souls. So we begin to see our soul the way it really is. But God's grace is such that he only allows as much as we can take. You know, St. Faustina in her diary was told by God, if I showed you the state of your own soul, you would die of horror. 
That makes me think what my soul must look like. If that's St. Faustina, I would. And yet, that day's coming when we come to purgatory. So, whether or not we go through all these three stages in this life, we're certainly going to go through them all in the next life. And it's going to be harder in the next life because we can't pray for ourselves when we're in purgatory. We can't ask the saints to pray for us. We can't ask anyone to pray for us when we're in purgatory. Our Lady comes to us. That's one of the things St. Faustina was shown. Our Lady came to the souls in purgatory and she revealed herself as the star of the sea. She was there to help console. But God was greatly distressed. He said, I don't want these souls to suffer in purgatory, but my justice demands it. And so it's harder because they can't pray for themselves and they can't ask for prayer. Instead, they are dependent completely upon our prayers and our sacrifices and the masses that we offer up for them. And we need to do that because the day will come away in purgatory and we will need others to do that for us. You know, St. Catherine of Siena, he was terrified of her father experiencing purgatory. And she said to God, please don't let him die. Eh, please, please allow him to live. Please don't let him suffer in purgatory. But his justice demanded, even though his mercy didn't want it, his justice demanded that he would have to go to purgatory to be purified. So before he died, I mean, he was constantly, it looked like he was going to die, it looked like he was going to live, die, live, die, and live. I mean, his justice was taking him, but his mercy, because of St. Faustina's prayers, was keeping him alive. And in the end, not St. Faustina, St. Catherine, and in the end, St. Catherine of Siena said to God, allow me to suffer everything that he would in purgatory so that he doesn't need to go to purgatory. And the moment he died, she suffered everything for the rest of her life. She got the whole lot. But then her father would visit her and say, and offer her consolation and thank yous for, for taking his place. So it's important that we offer masses and we suffer. And every, because we're all going to suffer anyway, we need to direct our suffering to helping other people. Even people who are not in purgatory, our loved ones. And you might not know anyone who's suffering, but you do have family members that are still going to benefit from it. One man who is suffering incredibly, he, his suffering only changed when he walked to his newborn baby laying in the bed and said, God, I offer this up for the future of my child. In that moment, his suffering became a blessing because now it had meaning and purpose. So, suffering is important and suffering is a gift. And so even though we go through these stages and it is a constant purification, a purgation, even though it feels like a fire in the soul because it's burning away all our sins and the wounds of sins, we have to see suffering as a gift. It's a gift because it helps us to be more closely connected to Jesus who suffered. Because conversion is where Jesus wants to live, relive his life, death and resurrection in you and me. That's true conversion. Jesus wants to relive his own life in you, which means his passion, because he wants to resurrect you. But before he can resurrect you, he has to, you have to go through the crucifixion. He wants to relive his life, death, life and death in you so that you can raise with him. Because we're still sinners, we still fall, we're still attached to self, and he wants us to let go of self and be completely absorbed by him, in him. Every time we make the sign of the cross, Pope Benedict says the word, um, the sign, every time we make the sign of the cross, we say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <coughs> Pope Benedict says we're not doing that on behalf of somebody else. Like John Hesketh is here in the name of Miles. I'm here on behalf of Miles. That's not what it means to say in the name of. Instead, when we make the sign of the cross, what we're doing by saying in the name of is we are immersing ourselves in the Trinity. We're immersing ourselves in the very life of God. And we're allowing him to immerse himself in us. Full immersion. So remember that the next time you make the sign of the cross, which we all take for granted. We are immersing ourselves in him. Especially when you put your hand in the water. Which reminds us of our baptism. And the word baptism means immersion. So that's the illuminative stage. And the aim of the illuminative stage is 
contemplation. The aim of the Christian life is contemplation, which is where we just spend time with God, hearing his voice, and experiencing the one-on-one -on -one relationship with him, which nothing can separate us from. When you are close to God, you know, you know it's contemplation. <clears throat> Because you just feel that unity, that union with God. And that leads us then to the unitive stage. And between the illuminative stage and the unitive stage can take a long time. You know, Mother Teresa experienced the dark night of the soul for 39 years. And every now and then God would come to it with consolation. You know why she experienced it? Because at the beginning of the conversion, when she was called by God, it was because she heard Jesus on the cross when he said, I thirst. She wants to experience that thirst. Because when she heard Jesus on the cross say, I thirst, she knew that Jesus meant, I am not thirsty for water. I am not thirsty for something to drink. She knew when Jesus said, I thirst, he was thirsting for souls, for you and me. And, and Mother Teresa made it her vocation to satiate the thirst of Christ for the love of souls. She wants to experience the thirst of Christ for the love of souls. But that meant she had to also experience the abandonment. The abandonment of God. The dark night of the soul. Because that's what Jesus experienced on the cross. When he said, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? My God, my God. That's Jesus' experience in the dark night of the soul right there. Why hast thou forsaken me? And so Mother Teresa experienced this for 39 years. St. Paul of the Cross, he experienced the dark night of the soul for 45 years. A long time. But once you experience, once you experience all these stages, and once you arrive at the unitive stage, then you experience a bliss and a love that is indescribable. And that's where we're all headed. And that's where we're all going to be. God willing, we'll make it in the next life. Any more questions? Yes. I just want to say you help me so, so much. I don't know how you manage it because of what I've experienced for the past couple of years. I, I'm just, I, I just don't know how to manage it. Pray for me, especially if I die before you and I'm in Pegasus. <laughs> <laughs> I should be telling everybody that every time I go to her, pray, I say, pray for me, don't canonize me, pray for me. Let's end in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the gifts that you give us, even gifts that we don't fully understand. We thank you when we go through feelings of dryness, help us to see this as a gift. Help us to see that it's not all about us, but it is all about you. Give us the strength and the motivation to pray to you, to praise you especially when we don't feel like it. Help us to communicate this to others who are going through the same struggles as well. And we ask Mary also, who never felt like being with Jesus when he was crucified because it was such a struggle for her, but did it out of love because being with her son was more than feeling, it was love. And so we ask her to pray for us, especially when we struggle in our emotions, in our feelings, in our weakness. Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for your time. Thank you.